Hi, I'm Sportster Paul. We're here with SolidWorks Cam, which is the same as CamWorks. This is a free version, comes with SolidWorks 2018 to 20. This happens to be a 20. It's not a perpetual license. You stop paying your SolidWorks maintenance, this stops working. For 2400 3000 with maintenance, you can get SolidWorks Cam Professional, same as CamWorks Premium. It's 2.5D still, but I believe, I'm told, it has a perpetual license. After that, you can go to a full 3D CamWorks Mill. I think that's 5500 seven grand with maintenance. So we made this part. Let's go look at this part here. <clears throat> this is a part that my friend Dave Rui in Silicon Valley made to test the CAM program. It's meant to be hard to recognize and, and make features out of uh, these automatic feature recognitions. And sure enough, uh, SolidWorks CAM had a lot of problems. It made this pocket. The big top pocket, it made it too, uh, too shallow. It didn't come up to this top surface here. It didn't know what to do to jump over these breakout holes. So we fixed all that first episode, second episode, third episode. Now we are going to just finish up and try to get this in a ready to go to the mill state. The first problem, I made a mistake last time. Let's go look real quick. Simulate. I've got, as you always should, all these collisions are turned on because maybe you put the face mill, and as I was playing with this this morning, somehow face mill jumped underneath the, the center drills and it would have crashed had I not had this first one on. So I'm just going to the end and I'm going all the way to the end instead of going one move at a time. So you don't have to watch, you know, the animation's pretty, but it doesn't help us. This thing is different every time you look at it. Okay, I guess we do want to leave it out there. And you can see it's got these blue things here where, where the ball mill doing these ramps didn't get all the way down. And this is the important thing to know, this show differences. And it gives you a legend that always keeps hopping around whenever I move the mouse. This dark blue means it's not been cut. Red means it's gouged. And we know the holes are going to be red because the tap is outside diameter. The way SolidWorks shows the holes is inside diameter. So that they're shaded red doesn't bother us. But this... Let's see if I could go real quick. Oh, I know how to do this. Normal. And then just zoom in real here. I changed the zoom wheel to work like TurboCAD, which I tend to like. That's all. Why did it stop so soon? I found out how to fix that. I also found out putting in some of these three axis features. It's actually easier on me to do it here where you can go three axis operation area Z or flat. Doing it from the feature, which is the theory of this whole thing, caused problems. I did figure out, double click on this. Here. See, I, all I did was pick these two faces. Because I said, well, that's what I want the ramp to be. Mistake. Operator error. Pick that one face. Say OK. It says, oh, the tool paths are going to change. That's a good sign, right? And it's done its thing. And now when we go look at it, see, before the tool path didn't go past that line. You could just tell it's gone further. And if we simulate it, simulate tool path, go to the end. That blue is much smaller, almost indistinguishable. You do here, you know, yeah, it's not perfect. You can get a pencil mill maybe and go in and make it even tighter, like an eighth inch or a sixteenth inch, and get a, sh if it's important to have a sharp corner. But operator error on my part. Okay, so we fix that. Uh, Next, let's clean out the tools, okay? So we're using a quarter inch, fifth. So let's take the blue tools aren't used. So hold the control key down, the normal windows kind of select from many different things. Shift does all of them. And right click, ooh, right click, delete. Yeah, so now that's a little cleaned up. So we cleaned out the tools. <sighs> Here's the problem. I've got an Avid Benchtop Pro router. It's very stiff and it'll mill aluminum. I made a couple test cuts waiting to get the coolant system fixed and working a, a micro drop trico system. I had bought on eBay. Oops. And it was all gummed up. So I'm fixing that. But the couple test cuts just with WD-40 worked out fantastic. So this mill will cut all day long aluminum, but it's not stiff and it doesn't have a tool changer. So I don't want to change all these tools, right? So let's minimize the number of tools. Here's 
this flat end, and it shows you, that's kind of nice, right? So it does this, it does this, it does this, it does this. It's doing all these operations, right? This is, this thing is wrong. No, no, I'm sorry, I was looking at the tools. Because we set these up to do rough, rest, and finish, it uses the tools, so it's, it's using these rough mills, and then it'll go here to the, oops, are we in the tool tab? No. It'll finish them up with a quarter inch. The theory of high-speed machining, as I understand it, you, you know, don't change tools, go real fast, use a small tool, because I got a 24,000 RPM spindle, so what I'm going to do is the, these half inch tools that it was roughing with, I'm just going to drag them up and make them quarter inch. Now I can erase the half inch tool. The ball nose we can't change because that's what's doing the ramps. The face mill does the top and bottom facing. Well, you can do that with a quarter inch, right? Rather than set up the tool, find part zero, do all. And then you got the whole thing of once you face it off with one tool, now you got to make sure part zero is in the right spot. It's, it's not worth it to me. And say, delete. Yes. The drill, the tap, and the center drill, you got to use those. So now, you know, we're down to one, two, three, four, five tools. In my mill, I can't ridge a tap. I don't have an encoder on the spindle. So I, could, I can't even drill a quarter inch hole like these are because that exceeds the surface. Drilling's a hard operation. And the slowest my spindle will go is 8,000 RPM. And that's too fast for a quarter inch drill. An eighth inch drill, you can get away with it, but not a quarter inch. So I'm gonna have to ream these, change these to open pockets. Well, that's nothing you need to worry about. I'll do that on my own. Okay, so we got that cleaned out and that worked out pretty good. Consolidated the tools. Now. Let's go look parameters. This says it's going to take 55 minutes now. I forgot to show you at first. It was, I think, 29 or 26. But because we took those half inch mills out, we're facing instead of with a two inch face cutter, we're doing it with a quarter inch end mill. Wow, 55 minutes. That, that really blew up, you know, twice as long kind of thing. But watch the other mistake I haven't shown you. This I should have done right away. Machine mill. I have to open and close dialog boxes off the screen. If I close this dialog box here, it'll go to a non-existent monitor. So here's a tricky thing. You, see, you say, Avid, I built this in the technology database to show I've got a 24,000 RPM spindle and only three horsepower. Instead of this mil inch, uh, they don't even show you. They show you the, the spindle speed is only 12,000, but it can really haul on feed rate. My Avid, I know, I, you know, you look up the specs, it does 200 inches per minute for for maximum feed rate, but 24,000 RPM spindle. So it's slower feed rate, but much faster, twice as fast uh, spindle. It's also, I set it up to light duty. Here's what's tricky. You don't say, okay, now you say select. Then it gets smart and does it. Now I have to close off screen. Then I always like we're in the middle tab say generate tool pass, it does all the tool pass over just because I'm, I'm paranoid that it's, it's dangling and leaving old tool pass. Now let's go look at parameters, 30 minutes. That's pretty good. It's now, so it's a little worse than it was, but not horribly worse when it was using a half inch end mill and a two inch facing mill. Okay, so next project, we change the machine. Now let's consolidate these operations. This, you know, it's something to brag about, and, and I let it do this rough rest machining. Like, look at this top pocket. What rough rest machining means is it uses this big rough mill to hog out the, the bottom. And then it, because I put them all into one tool, right? Then it uses a, a smaller tool, in theory, to do the corners that it missed. Well, we don't have to worry about that anymore, right? So come here, double click. It's where you find things to change the fundamental. It seems like every dialog box or every feature is a little different the way you can affect it. You go into end condition to decide the fundamental kind of feature it is. We just want a rough. You can't say finish because then it'll just do the perimeter and leave a big chunk in the middle of this pocket. Leave it rough. It tells you it's sticking with the quarter inch end mill, which surprises me. I thought it might have. Well, it has to because it knows now it's only got one operation to do this. The tech database giveth, the tech 
database taketh away. So we did that. So now it says rough here instead of rough, rough rest, finish. Same thing, this lower pocket. This is this lower pocket we had to fix up because it was bridging these holes. The upper pocket didn't go high enough. So everything we had to do by hand, we're double click, end condition, just do a rough. And I know it's going to leave an allowance, and we'll fix that in a bit. Okay, so now it just does a rough. The perimeter on the outside of the part does a rough finish. No, I just do a rough. I mean, it's, it's because these Viper tools, these Destiny tool Viper end mills I like, they say you can use them for roughing or finishing. Rectangular pocket, this square thing, when it, when it was a rough half inch finish quarter, the half inch wasn't quite going. It left a little hook here, left a little hook here. Now that's not a problem. So, edit definition is the same as double clicking. End condition, just do a rough. Say OK. Life is good. So now it's smart up at the higher level feature because I've learned this thing could chase you in circles if you go change stuff. Apparently it does. Oh, OK, it blew up. This happened in practice, too. Somehow, because I changed that perimeter, it's decided the perimeter is up above the part. So you find a problem, you fix it. Manny Reali Vasquez taught me that perimeter open pocket. See, see how it's above the part now? I don't know why. Go here. Uh, end condition. Say bottom of the part. So that's where it was before when we switched it to blind and I add 20 thousands. We did this earlier. What, you can watch the little blue line here hop down 20 thousandths when I change focus. Watch. Click. There it goes. So that's so it goes a little below the part. So when you flip it over and deck the top, you face off the what, what is the top now, what used to be the bottom. There won't be like a sharp, razor sharp edge where the two tools just kind of met mathematically. This gives you a little overcut. Say, OK. Now let's go back over here. Rough mill, contour mill. Let's do even though we're going to eliminate some of these. Edit definition, edit definition. I don't think, or no, I'm sorry, I'm getting brain dead. Contour mill, generate toolpath. So it generated these toolpaths, but this is what I thought when I went over here and changed it, it would go here and eliminate those rest machining in the corner, in the profile. It doesn't, but that's not a crisis. Better than it takes stuff out and it doesn't tell you, right? So, okay, there's the rough and we want it. Here was the rough where it did the corners, but we don't have to do that anymore because it's using a quarter inch end mill. It can get all the way in the corners. So, delete that. Yes, please, delete it. So, once again, it does the rough. Contour. Well, we don't need that contour anymore. Where are we? Delete. Yes. So, it roughs here. Now it roughs this bottom pocket. There's the rest machining where it's just taking the corners out, which we don't have to worry about anymore. Delete. Yes. No, we're, we're up too high. OK. And here's the contour where it's just going around the edge. Once again, we don't need that. Now, don't delete toolpath. Oh, God, 50 ways to do anything, and you're never sure what they do. Rough, rough. OK, let's see. Does the top pocket? Does the bottom pocket? And what we're trying to do is this little face. I thought about, hey, why don't we just do one big deep pocket and use this as the edge, leaving a big chunk here, and then the second pocket in operation will just take that chunk. I just felt it was nice to have the machine be continuous around here so there wouldn't be a, a line going up to the edge. Dealer's choice, any way you want to do it. Okay, so rough, this is the perimeter, cut, contour. We don't have to do that anymore. We can take it out. Delete. Yes. So rough here, this is roughing. It's a quarter inch now. It, it goes enough. It gets it all cool. So this contour for that little front box. Oh, by the way, I try to say, oh, that's a flat. Let's try to define it as a flat. Same kind of thing. It plunges down. Open pocket. That's what that is. You know, I lay in bed thinking about what did I do wrong? Why did I have to draw a sketch to have this thing follow? I tried and tried. I'm sure an experienced machinist knows what to call this and how to make it work. I'm an engineer just learning this stuff. Where were we? I think we were deleting, right? Yes. Delete. Yes. So we got all these deleted now. So now it's kind of does that face, does the rough, does the lower rough, does the outside rough, does the front rough, does the Z-level slopes, the angles, ramps coming down. Faces off the bottom, center drill, drill, tap. Recycle bin, 
empty it. Are you sure? Absolutely. Once again, because I'm paranoid, I always say generate toolpath. You never know what dangles in these kind of programs where there's a, a whole workflow procedure. And then parameters. Now we're 25 minutes, right? So we're quicker, I believe. Well, we're, what did we start with? 26, 27? So now it's actually faster, but it's not quite correct. And here's what you got to do. The face mill. Let's go through all of these and look. I'm sorry, I got to keep dragging these on and off, but that's the way it works. Facing it, it, it faces down to the surface. There's no allowance, apparently, that I can find. There's an XY allowance for islands, you know, depth parameters. But it, it goes down to the face. And you can see it when we simulate it's green. That means it didn't leave any meat up there, but feeds and speeds. Because they're using the library, that's the technology database stuff. Say operation. See, because this is one of the reasons we got fast. It knows it's got a 24,000 RPM spindle because we corrected the machine type. So it's using 23,000. It's going at maximum rapid that machine can do. It's doing 200 inches a minute. But here's a problem. I want to use these Viper end mills. Let me get this PDF of the Viper uh, Destiny tool, Viper file. They're telling you, look at what's astonishing about these things. Oh, now I'm screwing up. Slotting and peripheral. So I, I, I don't understand if how can you slot with the radial depth of cut less than one? I would think these would be empty. But still, they're comfortable all day long, conservative at 1,200 in, uh, inches per minute, or surface feet per minute, I'm sorry. But if you want to really haul, just go as fast as the spindle goes. Over here, they're even, even where it's a peripheral cut, where you're just taking part, you're not in the part making a slot where the chips can't get out. They're more, you gotta go a little slower there. Aggressive maximum RPM, almost too good to be true. But there's another thing you have to worry about. I can't do anything right today. All right, these are the chip loads. If you take too small a chip, you'll say, oh, just be safe, take a small chip. The heat doesn't leave with the chip and it burns up your tool. So they're telling you, you use a quarter inch Destiny end mill, these Viper aluminum ones, Good for roughing, good for hog, good for roughing, good for finish. At least four thousandths of an inch per tooth they want you to whack off. No more than five thousandths. And it gets looser as you go up in size. Three eighths, half inch end mill, five eighths, three, you know, off you go. So that means first, if we can do twenty four thousand, people might argue with me, but I'm not saying my machine will take this. Let's just go on the theoretical here. 1500 that's getting in the aggressive zone for these destiny tools but look at how nice this worked out 0. 0.42 we've just breached into that 0. 0.4 i'm sorry into that four thousandths of an inch per per tooth whipping by and of course it matters you got to define it as a two flute end mill make sure that you know that's all right because if it's a four flute it changes all this so now we've you know we're really hauling here so let's go here, say OK. And I think I'm going to speed up. It's the same principle. Oh, there's one thing more different a little bit. Do the roughing, drag it on. Here, when you do roughing, it's going to leave 10 thousandths of an inch, thinking, oh, well, now you're going to come and contour, finish paths. Well, we're not doing that. We're taking all that out. I think it might be the high speed spindle way to do things. Feeds and speeds here, come operation. It's going 14. Well, we don't need to keep spindle speeds under 1,000 like on conventional carbide tooling, according to Destiny. We're going to find out. I'll buy some of these, and you know, we'll see. Chip load isn't big enough, according to Destiny. You know, you got to go by what they're telling you. They're smart people. They've been doing this for a living. So where was I? 200. Go back. This is the maximum my machine. Oh, it gets confused when it has too many trailing zeros. Now we're here, OK? because of my goofy Windows problem. And it only happens on SolidWorks Cam, but say, OK. So we fixed that. I might speed this up now and show you. We're just going to do that same thing to all of these.
So now we're at this ball mill and double click it. The ball mill, it doesn't need, you know, there's no allowance. It's going down. That's why those slopes were green when we simulated. Feeds and speeds, though, I would think, especially a ball mill where, you know, the center of it doesn't rotate. Uh, it's good to make these haul. I think it might be quite beneficial to go 24,000 RPM. That's where you get the horsepower. It's a 2.2 kilowatt spindle. Uh, 24,000. Okay, this one kind of blows up on us. Watch. 200 inches per minute. It's not taking a big enough chip. This is half of what Destiny recommends, and it could burn up the tool because you're cutting way more chips than you should. You want to get four to five thousandths of an inch. Now, let me think. You could either go faster, right? Then you'd be taking a bigger chunk of metal, but I can't because we're at 200. That's the fastest my machine can go as far as feed rate. But you can go slower in the spindle and that lets you move forward as that next tooth comes whipping around. All right, so let's slow this down to 12,000. And then go back up, see it changes this automatically. You're always fighting programs. Now we've got our chip load. Same thing, I'm not saying this, it's not flimsy machine, it's quite stiff actually. I'm not saying the machine can take this. There's a lot of things, but you might as well start at the most optimistic aggressive, right? So there's the ball end mill. Now we got one more to do, this face mill. Here, feeds and speeds, operation, 24,000, done, ready to go. Okay, now come up here, we're in the center tab here, generate tool path, just because I like doing all that over and over, just to make sure I understand. Uh, not simulate parameters 15 minutes okay so now we're going way fast uh, I guess we can close this one here this is this is pretty cleaned up right we're going really fast uh, I guess if, if you're unsure of things you can say simulate toolpath let it do ah see we changed that perimeter operation Always good to check the shank of the tool right here. Let me hold control down. You can pan in SolidWorks. God, I wish I'd have read that. Here, the shank, you're not allowed to hit. So this is what, you know, you get like a video game. Well, I just got to solve this problem. So you go to tools. Ooh, let's get a simulate. So you, you could do it individually, but that'd be stupid, right? You want to go to the tool, double click the tool. Well, I don't want the flute length to be one inch. That's why it's running out of flutes, right? You're not supposed to let that smooth shank spin against the side of the part. Uh, a chip can get in there. One inch, make it 1.5. This is that is when you love this program. Watch. Boom. Shows you. Since we made the flutes longer, let's make the overall longer. 3.5. I don't even know if Destiny makes a tool like this. They have some long reach. But they, they, I do know they make tools where they narrow down the shank a little. You know, they cut a few thousands, which would change your deflections. You might have other problems, but uh, this will solve that problem. Edit tool parameter. I'm not sure. I close everything off the screen. I'm so paranoid. So now go back here. I always generate the tool path. It's the one thing that doesn't seem to damage anything. Simulate. Do your thing. It's thinking. This is a good sign. It hasn't crashed yet. It's got those balls. That's why it takes so long. Pretty cool. Show the differences. That's a key thing. See the red here? That's because the SolidWorks models, a tapped hole is the inner diameter of the threads. The, the machining simulation uses the outer diameter. And that makes sense for both reasons. So this shows up as red as being overcut or gouged or whatever you want to call it. Why do those little... I never can understand why this... I think it's a bug. You know, why it's getting into these colors, saying it thinks it's cut into a gouge, but it's not. All that's okay. Okay? So we're doing pretty good here. Now, what's the last thing? Consolidate operations. We did. Now, origins. This is something I should have done at the beginning, but I'm an American man, and I don't read the manual. Right? Sorry. Should have shown you right away. See, there's a little arrow, a little exclamation point. This is when I get my magnifying glass out, and it's like, oh, yeah, there's a little exclamation point. Like when, what was it, the center drills or something popped up. You know, it wasn't in the tool crib or something. Okay, let's double-click on that. 
It hasn't been defined, and it was so hard. What's the difference between this one? I know each part setup where you put it in the vise. You need to origin that. My machinist buddies always call that part zero. There's machine zero, which is home when my machine goes up and homes. And then part zero, you go find, you move it around, and you can use tool probes, all kinds of different ways, edge finders. You find where you want zero to be on that part. You hit zero, 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 the machine out, and now the G-codes will match the way it is in the vise. Pretty important stuff. That's why you always try this stuff up in the air before you make a part. They help you stock bounding box. And I figured to have it in the vise kind of like this where this is the front, the fixed jaw of the vise is in the back. Figure, open the pocket up this way. I'm right-handed. I can get an air hose in there and blow chips out. So I want the origin not to be in the middle and certainly not down buried. Well, actually, they have it on the top of the stock. Oh, because I checked top of stock. All right, so back here. Now the axes are wrong. This is the stock coordinate system. And I've heard it referred in one of the thousands of dialog boxes in this program. So that's how it relates, and I think it'll inherit the first setup. If you make the first setup, it'll go by this. But you see how X is going to the left? Not in my machine. My machine homes to the left, which means positive X is towards the right. Also, this has Y going towards me. Well, that's a conventional mill. I see that on this gantry style, since it homes up front. It's positive Y is going towards the back. Not too hard. You can say, let's try X. You know, go over here, click, highlight that. Pick, an, pick something that is X. Ah, didn't change. Okay, now it changed, but Z went in the wrong direction. So go Z, pick that. Now this thing is right. Z goes up, X goes to the right, Y goes to the back. And it confused the heck out of me. It's like, well, Z really isn't going up because the thing homes, my machine homes all the way up. So positive G code, positive Z is going down. Watch how they fix this. Okay, we're going to say okay. Now it says user defined. The little checkbox goes away. Now let's close up our setup. Top setup is set up here like in the vise. Bottom setup, we'll flip it around. And you can see there's trouble, right? It's got these origins here and here. How do you find an origin when it's inside the stock? Well, you don't. So you double click on that. Gives you different dialog boxes. Having a little trouble pulling this one off. Okay. So, entity, I think. No, we're in axis. Forget it. Forget it. Please select an entity. Oh, God. This drives me nuts. Stock vertex. Now they don't let you pick the vertex itself. You got to play find the vertex up here. There it is. Once again, X is in the wrong. So, that's why we want to be in this of the thousand tabs. I had the most trouble just trying to get this to do one. 80. I think it actually, by going there and back, is the way it finally took. It's up on the stock now where you can find that zero, right? How do you find zero when the, when the origin's inside the part? You can't. X is in the right direction towards the right, right. Y is in the right direction towards the back. And now notice how they fix things to make more sense. To me, at least, Z is pointing down. So as positive tool paths go down, everything kind of lines up. We're happy campers. Do new tool paths. Oh, well, I'm, I'm happy because you should have new tool paths. We've changed the origin. So now G000 is going to be right there. Yes, it thinks that's fine. Okay, the bottom. Now, how are you on a chain? This is all your choice. I figure when I flip this thing upside down to do the bottom, I'm going to flip it like this. Now the fixed jaw of the vise will be on this part of it. Leave this cut out towards my right. Double click. Get it out of the way. You think I closed it? It would open where it closed. Oh, once again, it's on the wrong tab. Origin, stock vertex, and it's confusing as heck. I'm sorry. I got to move this out of the way so you can see. Is it this one? <laughs> the last one I'm going to pick. It's going to be... There you go. Of course, it's last. When you, when you pick the right one, then you can stop picking. And now, once again, X is in the right, wrong direction. Positive X is going to the left. Not on my machine. So... Once again, so hard to get this to understand. 180 degrees, then see there. Now it took it. So I guess if you re-click angle, yeah, see how it flashed? Re-click angle, then it'll finally take what you type in. Now it's the way I want. 
X goes. So you flip it over, and remember, you've, you've decked the top of this part so it's going to go down lower in the vise. You've cut the perimeter around it, so you know it's, it's not where the machine thinks. You've got to refine the zero. It's still got a bunch of stock on the top. I think we can say OK here. Do your new tool pass. Please do. Let me show you the stock. So, OK, you can find that corner now. You know, you flip it around. Now you're clamping directly on the part surface down here with the vise jaws. And then you can go find the edges, depending. I have a tool probe that I got with the Avid machine. They sell a tool probe. Uh, you can find the edges, but you're trying to make, I'm sorry, get the stock. You're trying to make this point right here, zero, zero, zero. And when, when you get the tool there, one by hook or crook, if you find an edge with an edge finder, you got to do a little subtraction. But in theory, you want zero, zero, zero G code. You want to reset everything to zero when the tool would be right there. That's the nice thing about the tool probe. It's like an inch up and a half inch over, and it, uh, it puts all that automatically. It's got a little script inside the Mach 4 controller. So that is that. Here we go. I like showing this. Uh, why does this box? Oh, because I went to simulation. Middle tab. I, let's generate the tool pass all over again. That's how paranoid I get. Parameters, 15 minutes. Now, the other thing I wanted to show you about when we sp sped up all those feeds and speeds, that HSM advisor guy who sells HSM advisor sounds like a great thing. There's also that CNC cookbook fellow who has a G code wizard and a speeds and feed wizard, similar kind of thing. They're helping you here. I've, I've started filling this in. It's, it's, a, it's a quarter inch. Can I make this taller for you folks? No, I'm already below it, huh? Okay. 6061, that's the right material. It's an end mill, it's carbide. I put titanium nitride. It, these, the Vipers come with, you can get them plain or you can get them with a stealth coating. It's black and it rubs off on the first cut and people think it's gone, but they just do them black overcoat so you can tell one from the other, right? But they're supposed to be even faster and, and lo longer lasting. Tip diameter, I, I decided to take Two tenths, and this is where you'd have to change all your step overs and all that stuff. Uh, feed rate 100%. And this is telling you, oh, look, this is just what I wanted. I messed with this ahead of time, right? 0.44 inches per tooth. But this is where you're going to be concerned because based on these, oh, I need 1.4 horsepower and 3.7 inch pounds of torque. How much torque do I have in this 24,000 RPM spindle? Because it's constant torque. You can put 2.2 kilowatts, same as three horsepower, put the speed, say calculate at when technology, and it tells you I've got 7.75 inch pounds, prefer metric, 0.88 newton meters. But because HSM advisor fella is inches, let's stick with that, 7.75, go back here. Oh, that's pretty good, right? We got like half. We got twice as much torque, twice as much horsepower as we need. The tool deflections, which you worry about with a quarter inch end mill, four ten thousandths, probably get away with it. It's, it's that long tool. See this, I probably didn't put in the right tool length. Units, tip diameter, length. That I believe is the cutting. That's not the overall length. So if we made this 1.5 inches, does it do everything over for us? Now we have two tenths, or I'm sorry, two thousandths of deflection. But you can use this, you know, and, and it, this could be in the technology database, and I'm sure there's a way to get it in there. But this is the way you can say, hey, if my machine could take it, and I doubt that it will. I know I want to go 24,000 RPM, because that's where you get the full horsepower. You get three horsepower there. At 12,000 RPM, you get 1.5 you know, right down linear. And that you can operate this between 8,000 minimum and 24,000 maximum. So this is how you can go and jigger. Cancel the statistics because we're fast now. Oh, you know, pick one. Pick this rough mill. Here it comes. Now you can go into the roughing. And the great thing I learned here is instead of percentages, you can actually, oh, that's less than I, I asked for. What did I ask for? I asked for a width of cut of a tenth. So, you know, you got to kind of massage things, work back and forth to make sure you don't exceed the torque or the horsepower. You got to have the torque or you won't have the, the, the twisting force to carve that chip. 
but you want to run the spindle as fast as you possibly can within surface. You probably lose surface finish as you do that. So, but we're all going to play with this. You know, I got my little sample part. Drag this off, close this. I liked looking at that. Let's let's make this our go out screen. All right, so we got through this part. We got it kind of ready to go to the mill. I actually have a block of aluminum. It says 6511H. eBay said it was 6061. I'm not going to start cutting with this part. I'm going to start the next few videos will be how to program this little ellipse. This is Home Depot aluminum 6063, which is a little gummier. Uh, it should be harder to machine. I already did two before I, I ordered a Trico micro dot uh, coolant system and it was eBay junk broken. I had to clean it all out, fix it. That's in process. That's why we're not making chips today. But the surface finish on this hole that it made was fantastic. So we're going to play around with this. We'll show you how to program this. We'll show you how to do uh, get to a real machine and make some chips. And that I think it'll be much more satisfying than just programming stuff. Also, I found a way to go into the technology database using a tool called DB browser, which opens that database. It's an SQL it SQL light used to be Microsoft access shows you how good Camworks is because that Microsoft access has caused problems for everybody. I know that's used it. So they switched to SQL light in 2017. This DB browser lets you open it. So instead of adding tools one at a time, you can make you can export a CBS comma separated CSV comma separated file and just copy it's a lot of work. That's going to be a whole episode. How to copy it out of the tech, the Destiny Tool Catalog, adjust everything so it's the right kind of numbers, paste it into the into this uh, comma file, then upload it back in. And of course, you want to be careful with all this, and it might be really dangerous to do this. But I thought it would be interesting to show how you can manipulate the technology database directly and put 20 parts in in one whack instead of one part at a time. Okay. Well, we're running long. This is it for this part. Uh, we'll do that real quick thing about the technology database and we'll start work and hopefully my Trico stuff will come from uh, Amazon and I can fix that thing completely. I got half of it working. I got one one side working and then we're going to start programming, but it's going to be more about let's learn about the machine. Let's learn about the speeds and feeds and I might go back and revisit that. Oops, revisit that first part. I call it first impression, second, third. I might do a fourth because my buddy Dave says, no, you'd hold it from underneath. You'd cut the round thing first. And we've learned so much doing this gristle part, he would call it, where it's made to be hard. So we'll get back to all that. Meanwhile, have fun with your cam projects. Good luck. We'll see you next time.